Good vibes in competition. Carolina Panthers training camp is finally here, and I cannot wait for the 2022 NFL season. You are Locked On Panthers, your daily Carolina Panthers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of the Locked On Panthers podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, as always, Julian Council. Talking Carolina Panthers with you every Monday through Friday, your team every day. That's what we do here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Make sure to watch the show and subscribe to the show over on our Locked On Panthers YouTube channel. Almost up to 2,200 subscribers on the show page. Start off on YouTube back in late February. And thank you to everyone who's been a supreme supporter of the podcast since we moved over to YouTube. And you can also check out the podcast on all the traditional podcasting platforms, whether it be Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, Stitcher, TuneIn, all of them. We are out there. Just make sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show so you don't miss a single episode of Locked on Panthers. And if you want to ever interact with me and the show, be sure to follow me on Twitter at Julian Council, where every single Friday I answer your weekly Friday mailbag questions. To participate in this week's weekly Friday mailbag, either at me at Julian Council or DM me at Julian Council. But first, of course, go ahead and click that follow button over there on Twitter at Julian Council. The wait is finally over this morning. The Carolina Panthers will be out there on the practice field down at Wofford College in Spartanburg, South Carolina for training camp ahead of their 28th season in the National Football League. Got down there on Tuesday and the vibes were good. And I'm going to talk a lot about that on today's show because this is the time of year where everyone is in the best shape of their life cannot wait to get out on the field and is just so excited for the upcoming season the players the coaches the fans you and me the hosts and the listener to this of this podcast we're all excited in the nfl better than any professional sport at least in this country sells hope better than anyone else the nba if you're in a big market you're gonna have hope but here in charlotte especially what's going on with Miles Bridges and the heinous things that he is accused of and the three felony charges and the Hornets having sat on their hands waiting for the legal process to play out. Not much positive going on in a small market, as they like to call Charlotte, and I always resent that. But in the NBA terms, we're a small market. And the NHL, don't really follow that. It seems like, I guess, everyone can have a chance. There's more parity than other sports. I mean, Tampa Bay has been to, what, four straight or three straight Stanley Cups, I don't know. Denver just won, or Colorado, the Avalanche just won. So there seems to be parity. But do they sell the hope that you we kind of see here in baseball? Either your team spends a lot of money, or your team spends no money at all. The Pirates, the Reds, those are just annual teams that aren't very good in Major League Baseball. But the NFL does it better than anybody else, and that's why it is the most popular sport in this country, followed by college football. We cannot get enough of football, and when we don't have it, we miss it. Now, there are plenty of times, especially on Panthers Twitter and as Panther fans where we've looked at this team the last couple of years and wondered, man, are we ever going to turn it around? Are they ever going to find a quarterback? Is this the right head coach? Do we have a real GM now, which I think that we do in Scott Fitter and the owner? Tepper Sports Entertainment execs are leaving seemingly every month. There's a Rock Hill debacle. But if you ignore all of that, the vibes are pretty good. And Scott Fitterer, the Carolina Panthers general manager, spoke to the media there on Tuesday afternoon down at Wofford as it's the first time that they've talked to him, and I guess in a couple of weeks since he introduced Baker Mayfield uh, to the team and the organization. And, you know, he talked about just how it has the feel of 2012 Seattle. And I had someone ask me this a couple of weeks ago on the weekly Friday mailbag, if I could see the parallels between this Panthers team and that Seahawks team with Pete Carroll in his third year after not being very competitive the first couple of years and then having a quarterback taken in the third round after bringing in, I guess, well, not really this year, but they had just brought in Matt Flynn in that time in Seattle. The Panthers had Sam Darnold. They're paying him $18 million. You're thinking, okay, maybe he's going to be the starter again 
although the Panther situation is a lot different than Seattle. And Scott Fitter talked about it, how at that time in Seattle, they were trying to find a quarterback. They had brought in Charlie, Charlie Whitehurst. They had, of course, paid Matt Flynn and brought him over from Green Bay. They brought in Russell, and Russell found a way to win the job. And they had a young, ascending defense with guys like Earl Thomas and Michael Bennett and Richard Sherman and, um, and Cam Chancellor. Like They had a lot of young, talented players. And you look at this team with Brian Burns and J.C. Horn and you could even throw in Shaq and Dante Jackson in there as well. And, and I guess I think I already said Jeremy Chin. Maybe I didn't. Either way, a lot of young, ascending defensive players. And you just need someone to come in here and stabilize this position at quarterback. And for the competition that is all over the place to lend itself to high-level play this upcoming year. And I feel good about that right now. He says he really likes the vibe of this team. That when they had their first meeting, and I'm sure we'll see it whenever they do Camp Confidential, as the Panthers digital team does a superb job taking us inside the organization, you'll see the hugs. You'll see the smiles. Matt Rule, who we'll talk about more what he had to say here in a moment, he was talking about how when he came in, I mean, people came in early. Guys were there Monday night ready to go. Like There was a talk, I mean, he talked to media on Monday, and he said how his son, Brian, who's going to be working the, the equipment staff, had a ping pong game set up with Christian McCaffrey. CMC was already there. He's ready to go. Shaq and Baker showing up together. Does that mean anything? I don't know. I'll get into more of it later. The vibes are good here in Carolina, and I'm happy to hear that after so much negativity. And I'm not going to sit here and act like I'm always the most positive. I try to be honest with y'all. If I think things are good, I'll tell you. If I think things are bad, I'll tell you. Like the owner, not with it. But outside of that, I see a lot of good things. Now, a few updates that Scott Fitter did give us on Tuesday afternoon. Shaq Thompson, we already knew this after Matt Rule spoke to the media on Monday that he would be going on the PUP list, physically unable to perform. The hope is that he'll be ready to go. The expectation, at least, is he'll be ready to go week one against the Cleveland Browns. Everyone else has passed their physical. Matt Rule did mention, though, that they'd have their conditioning test, and that might lead to maybe other players having to go up there on a PUP list. Someone to look out for is Davion Nixon, who had the season-ending uh, knee surgery last year, was not a participant during OTAs or mandatory minicamp, and he looks like he's going to be a full participant. He's cleared to go, but will he go on the PUP list? We'll find out. Of course, later on, Rashawn Melvin, who is a veteran corner, didn't make the team last year, but then found a way back on the practice squad and in the active roster with injuries later on in the season, even early on in the season. He has not arrived. He has a personal thing. He may come. He may not. Uh, we don't really know what's happening there. Scott Ferry didn't lend, lend us too much um, as far as the insight there, but everyone they expected to show up has shown up, including Xavier Woods, who we did not see during OTA's mandatory minicamp. He was excused because his wife had a child. He and, he and his wife, they had a child, so family more important. Didn't really need him out there during the voluntary portion, even those three days uh, in June, back when the majority of the veterans weren't even participating during that period of time. Now, do the Carolina Panthers have their roster set? Got 90 guys. We, for the most part, know who the 53 is likely going to be. At least we know the 60 guys that are competing for those 53 spots. Scott Fitter did say that they're still on the lookout for, ideally, a defensive tackle and a traditional pass rusher. Two names that we've heard over the last couple weeks have been Carlos Dunlap, and it's been uh, Danny Shelton, who we talked about yesterday, a veteran who's been to a couple stops and can be someone who can come in at defensive tackle and add some depth. That would affect, of course, guys like Nixon, who's coming off of an injury. And they, even he even said, Scott Fitter, that they would love a three technique, which is what Davion Nixon could be. And uh, we see Matt Ioannidis have success in Washington when he's been healthy at that position. And maybe even Itor Grossmato slips in to do that. But Derek Brown's back. Bill Hoskins, Bravion Roy, who's been more of a run stuffer. Could they add more of a veteran presence there at defensive tackle? We'll see. At edge rusher, and Phil in, not Phil, but um, Scott Fitter said this as much. Someone also called him Matt Rule uh, opening up that press conference. He said it was an insult to Matt, um, which is funny. Uh, but Scott Fitter was saying that it's, Carlos Dunlap is an incredible player. Had eight and a half sacks last year. That's not necessarily the total that we saw. Or maybe it was six and a half sacks, whatever it was. It was about six and a half, eight and a half. But big difference, obviously. I think it was six and a half sacks last year, I think, in Seattle. And... Excuse me, uh, he was talking about how, like, you know, getting someone like that would absolutely help him. 
So another big body and a traditional pass rusher, they're still looking out for that. The quarterback competition will be obviously one of the key things that we look at throughout the entirety of training camp. Likely the four guys on the roster right now, PJ Walker, Matt Corral, Sam Darnold, Baker Mayfield. The expectation is that they'll probably keep three quarterbacks. I don't see a scenario how they're going to be able to cut Sam Darnold. Just $18 million in dead cap wouldn't make a ton of sense. And as far as trades, we'll have to see how the rest of the quarterback market plays out if anyone gets injured and if a team is willing to take on Sam Darnold. But the Panthers, of course, would likely have to do what they did with Teddy Bridgewater and what the Browns did with Baker Mayfield and pay for the bulk of that salary to offload him this upcoming season if there is someone out there that is desperate enough to get Sam Darnold on the roster. And one other thing, too, about that with the quarterback competition, we're going to talk a lot about competition in the vibe here shortly, as we've already kind of started that here on the show. Matt Corral, he's coming in here with the, the mentality that he's trying to compete, which is what you want to hear. Scott Fitter mainly focused, though, on Sam Darnold and Baker Mayfield and how that works out. He said they're going to give everybody an equal opportunity, a fair chance to get the starting job. We know this is a, to- a two-horse race. Maybe it could be a three-horse race. P.J. Walker, I don't see him being in it. So Matt Corral, Baker Mayfield, Sam Darnold, those are three guys who are going to get an opportunity. And really, Sam and Baker, and Baker should be the one that comes out on top once he grabs a firm hold of Ben McAdoo's offense and is able to grow a good relationship with a lot of these guys on this team and ascend as a leader. In part by having Baker here, Scott Fitter said that they never want to put a ton of pressure on Matt Corral early. Like they're going to let it play out, and it'll, obvious, it'll become obvious over time who their guy is, but they're going to give Matt, Matt Corral a chance. They're not asking him to go out there and be the starter. They're going to give him an opportunity. And if he does not become the guy, then that's okay because you still have Sam here and you have Baker here. And if the pressure isn't on the third-round rookie to come in and to save the franchise, as many people think he might be able to do or are all in on already, which is putting entirely too many expectations on Matt Corral, who's a young, good developmental prospect who could eventually be the guy here in Carolina. And one other thing before to take a quick pause here is Christian McCaffrey. I'm going to be plenty of questions about Christian and his health. He was asked, I think, by Vash Ty Hurt of Carolina Blitz if he's tired of hearing all the questions about his routine and if he feels good, if if he needs to change things up. And I guess some in, in Christian's like, yeah, well, it, it, it comes with the territory. I understand I've been injured, missed 23 games the last couple of seasons. Like, it's going to be a question that y'all ask me until, obviously, I stay healthy as far as what his workout program is going to look like. And Matt Rule said on Monday they are expecting to do a lot of the same. Apparently, Christian has brought his own new kind of workout schedule to the team, and they're on board with it. Scott Fitter wouldn't really give us an insight on what's going on, but the team's on board with it. Christian McCaffrey's on board with it, and the hope is that he'll be ready to go come week one, and he'll be ready to go come week 10 and 15 and 18, and hopefully in the playoffs in January. So the vibes are good, Scott Fitter. They're giving us an update on how things are playing out so far as the team gets set to actually hit the practice field this Wednesday morning. So very excited about that. Matt Rule also talked to the media on Tuesday again. And really the theme from him, from Fitterer, from DJ Moore, and everyone else out there has been competition. Let's get into that more here in just a moment on Locked On Panthers. Hindsight is 2020 and you can't change the past, but what if you could get a little help from your future self? Maybe you'd ask to borrow a little cash. Now you can with Dave. Dave is a banking app that can help you get up to $500 instantly with extra cash. That's more money to fill your tank, buy a wedding gift, or catch up on bills. You can finally tackle those expenses that have been stressing you out without any hangups. There's no interest and no credit check needed. Millions of people have already downloaded the Dave app to get the financial relief they need of extra cash. So if you're in a pinch and need some extra help, download Dave and think it as a helping hand from future you. Download the Dave app from the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store right now. That's D-A-V-E. Sign up for an extra cash account and get up to $500 instantly. For terms and conditions, go to dave.com slash legal. Instant transfer fees apply. Banking provided by Evolve member FDIC. Future you will thank you. Good vibes in competition. Those were the two key words of the day 
on Tuesday as Carolina Panthers reported to training camp in Spartanburg, South Carolina, on the campus of Wofford College ahead of their 28th season playing in the National Football League. And there was hugs, there were smiles, everyone's happy to be there. They're feeling like they're in the best shape of their lives. Chris McCaffrey even said that. I feel great, feel the best I've ever felt. I'm ready to go. I know my teammates are as well, and we're all excited to be here. It's that time of the year. It's also the time to compete, to go out there and win jobs and find out which 53 of these men down there can help this team get to the playoffs and have success here in 2022. It's been far too long. And I get 2017, it doesn't feel like it was that long ago, but considering how 2018 fell apart, how 2019 never really got a chance, 2020, no expectations, and then last season, it feels like a very long time since the Carolina Panthers were playing relevant football. And you just look at the schedule and the lack of primetime games outside of the Thursday night game that pretty much everyone in the league plays. There's not much appetite nationally to talk about the Carolina Panthers. And that needs to change. And the only way you can change it is by the guys on this roster to perform at a level where they capture the attention of the rest of the NFL. And we talked about last week, Jonathan Stewart, former Carolina Panthers running back and his tweet about how he thinks the Panthers are going to shock the world. And I listed out reasons why I felt like Jay Stu's not crazy to think that at all. I love what they've done this off season. And if they are able to fill the hole at edge rusher and bringing a guy like Carlos Dunlap, I will have no complaints about how the off season went. Not like I really have any complaints as is right now. Anyways, he checked every box I went over all, when I went over my offseason checklist with y'all multiple times on the podcast. I love what they've done. But they've already now, now all that's just a project projection. You're now here in training camp at Wofford. You're going to be in the sun, in the heat. You have to overcome that. It's now time to find out who's about it and who's not. And competition really is what matters the most when we talk about the two words we heard the most vibes and competition. What about forget the vibes? The vibes are always great this time of the year. Now, had Sam Darnold been the only quarterback here, then the vibes probably wouldn't be great. But either way, the vibes are always good this time of year. The reality of the situation is that every team's excited, things have a chance, feel like they're in the best shape of their life. But come December, the majority of the teams in this league are not going to be in it. And a lot of teams that felt great here in July and in early August going to feel real crappy by that time their fans will be telling them, tank, lose, let's focus on the draft. And I'm tired of having to focus on the draft here in Carolina. So the competition element of this training camp means a hell of a lot to me and means a hell of a lot to Scott Fitterer, this coaching staff, and everyone down there so far. DJ Moore, who was the first Panther to speak to the media upon arriving on Tuesday, talked about it boosts everybody's competitiveness. Every group is going to see the competition at the main spot. So all the competition is going to step up. There's nowhere to hide this year. DJ will be fine. Matt Rule even said, we know who, who's going to be the starters. We know Taylor Mullen's going to start at right tackle, but he's going to be competing against the guys opposite of him. He's going to be competing against Brian Burns, who says that he's pissed off about not having double-digit sacks over the last couple of seasons, hasn't gotten to that mark yet. He's been a pro bowler, but he hasn't gotten there yet. Until he gets there, he can't be an all-pro. He can't get broke off the way he wants to. Can't get that bag that he deserves. Got to get those, those, get those sacks. So you're going to go up against one of the best guys. And even Iki Aquanu who's competing with Brady Christensen, who Matt Rule said will play at left tackle and at left guard. Icky's going to have to prove that, hey, this guy from BYU, who, yeah, the coaching staff already thinks is one of their better O-linemen, whatever, man. No one valued that guy in the top 10 like me. No one talked about Brady Christensen like, like he could be a number one pick. Ain't nobody say that about him. Icky needs to come out there and show that dog that was in him at NC State and show that this dude from BYU ain't going to be the left tackle this year. But that's still fun because Brady Christensen needs to go push back and tell this rook that, look, man, you're coming in here. You might think that you might be entitled to this spot, but I want this spot. That's what we need to see. Guys going after each other's throats. Because, yeah, the hugs, the smiles, and all that are great. But once they get out there on the field, these are going to be going after each other. And I know we don't want to see training camp fights, but I don't think I would mind one at all. I want to see some nastiness. I want to see some physicality. I need dudes out there who hate other people and are ready to go at the rest of the league because it's been far too long since anyone had any respect for this organization. And those guys can be going out there and, and trying to get it. And a dude across from them and next to them also needs to be trying to earn the respect from the guy next to them. 
That's my opinion on that whole thing. So competition, I'm glad that they're fostering it. Because one of the big questions we had last year going to training camp was why was no one there trying to push Joey Sly, who was not a good kicker in 2020, and even the year prior to that in 2019, had not proven himself in the league and had cost his team games. But for whatever reason, they had no competition once they got down under Spartanburg. You could ask the same question. Why the hell was no one there to push Sam Darnold? P.J. Walker, fine backup, probably not even one of the top backups in the league. I don't know. Not really having a list. Don't care about it at all. But he wasn't pushing Sam Darnold. So how did that help Sam last year? Didn't help him at all. O-line being bad, Christian being hurt, certainly didn't help. But the organization didn't help Sam by not pushing him, by coddling him at every turn. That needs to be done. Competition everywhere. You look how deep the O-line is this year. We're talking about the five that we think are going to be the best. We think it's going to be Icky and Brady and Bradley Bozeman and Austin Corbett and Taylor Moten. Taylor's the only one who's guaranteed to be there. Of course, I think Austin Corbett ought to be there. We got, Deont- we got Deontay Brown, though, who looked pretty damn good week 18 against Tampa. We got him. Got Caden Mays, who's playing all over the offensive line, who's going to be trying to earn a spot. Then guys like Dennis Daly fighting for their lives. Michael Jordan out there trying to stay on this roster. Cam Irving fighting for his life out here. Same thing. With a um, of a Pat Elfline, who's in a second stop and might be getting replaced again. I love that. That's important. And a wide receiver, you know, Shai Smith, trying to stay on this roster. He could be gone. Rashard Higgins over here now. Yeah, Baker's. It doesn't mean you're going to be on the on the team. Does you're not guaranteed anything. DJ is fine. Robbie should be fine. But Robbie's need to step up. And Scott Fitter would talk about Robbie Anderson, how a lot of it was just, you know, the offense last year not clicking, and it wasn't necessarily all Robbie. Okay, Robbie, there's another guy they drafted last year who I think me and a lot of fans would rather see take your spot. There's a lot of guys out there who are coming for your job. We didn't know it last year, but someone like Frankie Louvre said, hey, my goal was to come out here and take somebody's job. So I'm excited to see the competition, in, and I love the mentality of a guy like Matt Corral as well, who Scott Fitter, as I mentioned earlier, didn't want to put a ton of pressure on him early to come out here and to compete and actually be called upon to be the starter. If it happens, it happens. But that's not what they're asking him to do. They want him to come in here, learn, and push the rest of these guys. And if he becomes a starter, he becomes a starter. But Matt Corral kind of looked back at Ole Miss when he got down to his recruitment. If you followed it, with him coming out of Ventura, California, he was originally supposed to go to Florida. And he decommitted from there, ended up at Ole Miss, and in part he did it because, well... A lot of college kids do the same thing. I want to go somewhere where I can play early. And I get it, especially at quarterback. Only one guy can play. You get, need to go find somewhere you can go show your talents. And he goes off to the NFL. And he was able to do that in Oxford at Ole Miss. But he actually said that he wishes that he had not taken the easy route back in college, saying that uh, going back, I take it back where I decided to go to college. I took the easy way because I felt like I could play right away. Knowing what I know now and trusting my instincts and trusting my work ethic, I would have went to a place that would have made me compete. Not to say he didn't love Ole Miss. And I'm sure Ole Miss fans might look at that and be like, wow, Matt, thanks a lot, man. <laughs> we embraced you and you, you, you disappointed you came there. What he's saying is like, I'm coming to this situation. I got two guys who were top three picks who had a weight of expectations in Cleveland and New York, respectively. And both of those guys failed at it, if we're just being honest. Neil Baker, probably more nuanced of a situation. But either way, Cleveland moved on. The Jets moved on. They didn't want Sam Brown. They'd rather have Zach Wilson instead. And he's got those guys in front of him, theoretically. But Matt Corral's not worried about that. He's, he's just going to trust in his hard work, his technique, his ability, and go out there and prove that he's the best one in that quarterback room. I love that. He also wanted to say the best of the best. They want competition, and I think for this room, it's going to be a great competition because we're all competitors and we all understand what the job is to get done, and we're going to do that. It's not just quarterback. It's not just O-line. With Shaq Thompson being on a PUP list, one of the better things I think might have happened to this team, blessing in disguise, is that he's not going to be there. Yeah, he'll be ready week one, hopefully. But now with Damian Wilson coming in here and Corey Littleton and Brandon Smith, who they just drafted, let's find out how deep this linebacker room is. Let's see all three of those guys push themselves to take over as a middle linebacker because the last two years have been terrible. To hear Whitehead was awful. Jermaine Carter Jr. wasn't up to snuff. Now he's in Kansas City. They need somebody to step up at that position and play at the level that we've grown accustomed to in Carolina. The Dan Morgans, the John Beesons, the Thomas Davises, the Luke Keekleys. We need to see that kind of play again here in Carolina at the linebacker spot. 
Competition is everywhere. And the Carolina Panthers finally figured it out that we can't just give guys jobs. You remember that Joe Person report late last season, back in December, how some players and their agents didn't think that it was an actual meritocracy in Carolina because you had these Temple guys. You had these Baylor guys coming in who no one else in the league wanted, but because they played for Matt Rule back in college, they were here. And I understand bringing in guys that you know to try to implement the process and whatever culture you're trying to cultivate here. But that the, the process building and culture building, is, it's got to be done. It's time to win games. It's time to compete. And it's damn well past time the Carolina Panthers actually lived that and brought in the competition that they have in camp this upcoming year. Now, one guy who's embraced the competition and who I honestly applaud is Sam Darnold. Now, one thing, though, that happened was Darnold showed up by himself while Baker Mayfield showed up with somebody who's already established himself as a leader on this team. Does that mean anything at all? We'll talk about it here in just a moment on Locked On Panthers. BetOnline.net is the fastest and the easiest way to check in on all your betting needs. Find all your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. Find reviews and news of every league, including Major League Baseball, the NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, and even golf. Bet Online continues to be the top online resource for all your sports wagering information from live in game betting scores and podcasts. They have you covered. Head to Bet Online today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action happening today. Bet Online, where the game starts. No matter how you feel about Sam Darnold as a player, and he's not proven to be a very good one, at least a high level player in the NFL so far, there was a ton of expectations for him coming out of USC and he has not lived up to those at this point in time. Despite what he says that he's proven he's a good quarterback in this league, he has not done that. But what he has proven, though, through the course of this offseason, as the Panthers were into Deshaun Watson sweepstakes, where they were inquiring in on Russell Wilson in Seattle, as they combed through the draft prospects at quarterback and decided that they were going to land on Matt Corral and trading for Baker Mayfield a couple of weeks ago, they have tried at every turn to replace Sam Darnold. But despite all that, Sam Donald has proven to be a pretty decent guy and to be a damn good teammate. And he talked to the media for the first time since Baker Mayfield came here to Carolina, and he, he spoke about how, you know, it's not the first time he's been in a quarterback competition. Someone asked him about, you know, have you been in one before? Notably back at USC, really when Sam Donald became a household name, he lost out to Max Brown, who was a five-star recruit one of his best friends, and he actually talked about this on that podcast, Busting with the Boys of Taylor Lewan. I encourage everyone to go back and listen to it. He talked about how him and Max Brown had a really good relationship, and then things kind of got awkward there for a little bit because they were competing against each other. But once Max won the job, Sam was you know, obviously not cool with it because he wanted to win, but they were cordial and respectful of each other. And then when Sam eventually took over in week four after they started off one and three and lost on a Friday night to Utah, he led that team to the Rose Bowl. And Max Brown supported him. So no matter what happens, Sam Brown's going to be supportive. He's already shown in the past that he can be supportive. And whether it's Baker, Matt Corral, or P.J. Walker, he's going to support every single guy in his quarterback room, which is why he was one of the first people to reach out to Baker Mayfield, which is why he told Baker about the throwing session that they had this past week and that we saw was all over Twitter and Instagram and had a bunch of people excited about the upcoming season. I applaud him for that, for understanding that this is about the team. It's not about me. It's about the team getting to where they need to go. And the competition is only going to make him better, hopefully, Baker better, Matt better, and PJ better. And everyone else on the roster who's competing, it's going to only make them better by having this many options in Carolina. And he, he also talked about, too, when he was asked about, hey, you know, a lot of guys don't love when things like this happen. And like, were you upset by it? Did you want to be traded? And he said, yeah, I talked to Coach Rule. I talked to Scott and you know, about what happened and what my role is going to be and all that. And I'm just excited to compete. And he also said, which was great to see that he has a self-awareness, which I'm not surprised that he does have, that he's not in a position to sit there and to re uh, request a trade. Because who the hell is trading for Sam Darnold after what he's done over the last four years? Well, the only position he's in right now is where he still has a chance to earn a starting job. I don't really see as a very good chance just based off of what the Panthers actions have been and the willingness to move on from Sam Darnold as far as someone being the QB one and not him being in that slot, but he has a chance. And at the beginning of this offseason, didn't really feel like he would have a chance this, this time of the year 
to have an op- opportunity to still be the starter and walk out the tunnel there week one against the Browns and be the first guy to take snaps against the Browns. He has a chance to do that. And part of me is really rooting for the guy. He seems, he seems like a great dude. All you ever hear is great things about him. I was talking to someone who works for the team a couple weeks ago, just about Sam. And they're like, the, the dude is just awesome. And I just want, they talk about how they want it so bad for him. And I want it for him too, man. I, I want Baker to be successful. I want Matt to be successful. I want PJ to be successful. But like, certainly when you're looking at guys, like I've always rooted for Baker Mayfield. I already told y'all about, you know, my affinity for Baker and his story and how he got to this point. I told y'all, I like Matt Corral. I'm just not going to assign the kind of expectations that a lot of fans have so far. I'm going to give it some time. But Sam Darnold, like the dude was awesome. At USC, like that Rose Bowl against Penn State, I still cannot get over the post route he threw over the middle for a touchdown, like just on a rope. Just one of the best throws that you're going to see from a college quarterback. And all the USC quarterbacks have come before him and just to put his name right up there with him. Now, USC quarterbacks haven't necessarily come to the NFL and had a lot of success. And they're all different individuals. I don't really assign that to the university in itself. I know people love to do that, like Ohio State, like, oh, we can't take Justin, Justin Fields because he went to Ohio State. None of that really matters. It just Some guys translate, some guys don't. But Sam Darnold's come out here with the right attitude. He's worked hard. He's trying to be a leader on this team. We'll see how things work out. So part of me will be rooting for Sam Darnold. I don't want to see the guy fail. He's already failed enough. And at this point, just you want to see him at least do a lot better than he's done so far in his career. But with all that said, though, Baker Mayfield's coming in here and he's already establishing himself. He already knew Sam through the draft process. DJ Moore talked about how he, how he knew him before. He's known Christian for a while now, and he's acclimated himself with the roster very early. And who did he roll up to, roll up with the training camp? None other than Shaq Thompson, who is, without a doubt, the defensive leader on this team. And Baker's there with him. And I was asked about this. I went on with Adam Gold on 99.9 to fan in Raleigh and across the state of North Carolina as that's a, a statewide syndicated show. And he asked me about, like, do I take anything from that? And to me, really, it's just, it's smart. You just moved to Charlotte. Do you, it, y'all, have you, you've driven down for the folks who live here in, in the Carolinas, especially who live on the I-85 corridor. You've driven down I-85 South once you get to the upstate, right? It is a complete disaster. Matt Rule used an analogy last year that the offensive line is like I-85 always under construction, which he didn't understand what he was saying, but what he said was absolutely correct at that point in time and unfortunately became a reality as the season wore on and they were always injured and there was seemed to be some sort of delays in road work with the offensive line. Like I wouldn't want to drive in that, especially if I just moved here. So I don't know. I don't know what the situation is, but it makes sense to me to carpool, especially if you're going to be down there for like three weeks. Why bring your own? Why bring your own vehicle? I don't know. Seems smart. Uh, But then you can try and look at it and see like, oh, maybe this is Baker's team now. I had someone tweet at me. I think post date. I mean, they they tagged me and a bunch of other Charlotte media people um, in the tweet being like, hey, it's Baker's team now because he showed up with Shaq. I don't take a ton from that. It is good to see that those two guys took the hour and a half drive, whatever it is. I mean, with traffic nowadays, drive down there to Spartanburg and they got a chance to sit there and talk. And who knows what conversations that they had. That's something that. Man, I really hope Panthers.com put a camera in there so we can get that on Camp Confidential. I would love to know the conversation that they had. But it should only make you happy that Baker Mayfield's coming here, that he's ingratiating himself with this team so far, which is what he did everywhere he's been so far. And now I understand things were on people in Cleveland when he got there. Guys loved him. At OU, they loved him. Texas Tech, they loved him. And so he fired in Carolina. They seem to love him. Don't take too much from it. Just glad to see Baker is already trying to step up and show himself as a leader. We didn't hear from him on Tuesday. I'm sure we'll hear from him today on Wednesday as the Panthers, again, hit the field for the first time for practice at training camp in Waff- or at Wofford in Spartanburg, South Carolina. So that's going to wrap up this edition of the Locked On Panthers podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, hosted by yours truly, Julian Council. Again, guys, make sure to follow the show and subscribe to the show. Watch it over on our Locked On Panthers YouTube channel. Rate, review, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all the other podcasting platforms out there. And follow me on Twitter, at Julian Council, right there on the screen if you're watching on YouTube, or you can at me or DM me there on Twitter, at Julian Council, for our weekly Friday mailbag. Go already getting some questions in, so go ahead and give me more questions as we approach Friday morning, or really Thursday afternoon. You guys need to get those questions in. And that's when I typically record. Um, but with that said, though, take care. Be happy, be easy as always. Keep pounding, and I will talk to y'all on Thursday.